it's great to be with everyone tonight. Um, I, I, I would like definitely to, to, to give a shout out to, to our sponsors, um, Dave down at Casters. I mean, those guys fish salt and um, fresh water. Uh, they got probably the, the largest fly tying supply in the Southeast that I've seen. And also to Carolyn Ward and her team down at the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, which is the primary funding uh, primary auxiliary funding means for the Blue Ridge Parkway. Very important. I just really appreciate them supporting us tonight. You're, 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 you're looking at um, a waterfall that many of you probably um, have seen before. This is Looking Glass Falls on Looking Glass Creek, which is one of the larger tributaries of, or the, or the largest tributary going into the Davidson River. And the reason that I'm using this image on the front of my book and for this webinar is that this was the first waterfall that I ever saw as a young boy from South Alabama. At seven years old um, is when I first saw this waterfall and I've, I've been enamored with it my, my entire life. Uh, it's where I caught my first trout. So it was only, it was only natural for it to, to be involved in this book and was, was quite a, a, you know, kind of a motivator for me to, to get this book done. Uh, it does come off the parkway. A lot of people say, well, Sam, that's seven or eight miles south of the parkway. Well, a lot of the rivers and streams in this book may be that distance from the parkway, but there are waters, in this case, Pounding Mill Branch and Cherry Branch drain from the parkway, uh, very close to it. And so, so that's the reason it's included uh, in there. Let me spend just a couple of minutes uh, talking about this book real quick. As Jason mentioned, it is a first in class book, meaning that there's not another book about fly fishing the Blue Ridge Parkway in its totality. Um, uh, something I'm proud of is that it's forwarded by Mark Woods, the superintendent of the Blue Ridge Parkway, or, or at least the re just recently retired superintendent. Mark did a great job during his tenure as superintendent during very difficult times, uh, sequestration and all the, the problems we were having at that time with funding. But, uh, you know, he got them through it, came out the other side. He's retired now and um, uh, it's 308 color pages, uh, with about 145 images in there. Um, a lot of parkway history. And the reason there's a lot of parkway history is that I just think people like to know, you know, a little bit about where they're fishing. I do talk about the trout, uh, Brook Brown and Rainbow Trout. Uh, and that's really mostly for the people who, who are buying this just for the parkway uh, study that's in here, not the fly fishermen. Most of you already know a lot of that information, although you may, you, you might learn something even about some of these trout. Um, I talk a lot about the parkway hydrology, you know, how it gets its water, what it does with it, uh, the, the, the various features of these streams that we're fishing and why they're important, how you can use them as a fisherman. And what I've done is break the, the 252 miles of Blue Ridge Parkway in North Carolina down into four 63 mile sections uh, to divide up those 200 plus river streams, creeks and seeps that are all over um, up and down the parkway to get them a little more organized. Um, I provide a lot of descriptions and access details. I will, I will show you examples of that tonight. Um, and a lot of history and lore, uh, outfitters, food, lodging and, and breweries uh, and smoke shops uh, are, you're all directed to the website, to the page and you can go by section if you're looking for a place to stay or to eat or camp, it's all in there. And the best part of all this, which is really important to me and something I'm very proud of, is that up to 10% of the profits of the book go back to the Blue Ridge Park. My favorite rod for these blue line streams, a lot of the blue line streams that I fish, is a Lacey and Johnson rod that I built 25 years ago when Gary Lacey and I um, were, were in business together. And it was actually an F.E. Thomas taper. It's a seven foot four weight. Um, and the wraps are F.E. Thomas. The only thing different is that I did put a rattan handle on it just because I like rattan handles. And this is my go-to rod for small streams. The other rod I fish with is, is with an L.L. Bean double L eight foot, five foot, which is which this particular rod is made on a Granger 
uh, 80 50 taper. And it's just a sweet casting, uh, soft setting. I mean, it'll put a dry fly on top of the water. You can, you can hardly see it go through the, the surface film. So those are the two rods that I, I love to fish the most. Um, here is how I have broken up the, the parkway into four sections. If you start at Cherokee over on the last, uh, over on the on the on the left side of your screen, it runs all the way uh, around the, the skirts, the, the 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 mountains, all the way below Waynesville and above Brevard, and ends at a place called Buck Springs. And Buck Springs, you may or may not know, was where George Vanderbilt had a huge Adirondack lodge up in the mountains, where he literally he could stand on the back of that deck and look down uh, Big Creek and see actually see his chalet uh, in, 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 in Asheville. And he could stand in Asheville and look up and see it. It's a pretty cool place. And then from, from there, which is really Mount, uh, where Mount Pisgah is, it goes north of Buck Springs, up right through Asheville, over the, 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 the side of Mount Mitchell, Mitchell, and then up to Spruce Pine, just past Highway 80. There's a lot of fishing water on, on this strip right here, including the Tow River and all of those areas, just a really great area to fish. And then the uh, section three leaves Highway 80, goes up through Spruce Pine, Linville, south of Banner Elk, um, and then through boat blowing rock and then it ends at E.B. Jeffries State Park. This is also a really great stretch of the parkway. You got Wilson Creek, Boone Fork. You just have some really good water along here. And then finally, um, the, the, the fourth section goes from E.B. Jeffries along the crest of the Appalachians uh, above uh, Stone Mountain State Park to the, to the state line, to the Virginia state line. And this area that I've highlighted here is really the area that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and for large, for a very large part of that is, is uh, Stone Mountain State Park. And I wanna spend a couple of minutes and talk about Stone Mountain. It's, it's 13,500 acres that's really split almost down the middle by, by the Wilkes and Allegheny County um, lines, indefinite lines that run through them. Uh, it was established in, in 1969. And in 1975, it, it was designated a, nat, a national natural landmark. Um, it's bounded on the north by the Blue Ridge Parkway, skirts right along the top of it, and to the west by Thurman Chatham Game Lands in Dalton Park. Uh, the main feature is what you're looking at. It's a 600 foot granite dome. It's actually two domes. The first one is Stone Mountain. You're looking at the south side of it, looking north. And then the one to the west of it is called Wolf Rock, which is not in this picture. And really what it is, is, is part of a 25 square mile underground pluton. Now you're probably asking yourself, what the heck is a pluton? Well, a pluton is nothing more than a, a big bubble of, of igneous rock that formed beneath the earth's surface with molten lava. And as it moved up, it bulged up over the earth's surface and hardened. And over time, of course, the softer rock has eroded off of it with the natural forces and left it as in the granite state that you see there now. Um, so, that's the big uh, landmark for Stone Mountain, how it, how it got its name. And it's the, the exactly the same formation that's in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And Stone Mountain in Georgia is a little bit bigger, I believe, a little bit taller, but it's, um, it's the same exact um, formation. Um, here's an overview of Stone Mountain Park. Um, I'm gonna show you the trout streams in just a moment, but you've got Stone Mountain down here uh, you got Stone Mountain Rock, and then you've got you got uh, Wolf Rock here, and there's the county line that runs right through. So Stone Mountain runs up, goes up the Parkway, and then kind of comes back down this way. All of this would be the 16 or the 13,000 acres. Now, to take an overview of the watersheds, um, that's what they look like. There's about eight uh, flows in and around Stone Mountain State Park that fish very well. I mean, some people take issue with that, but, but I catch fish every time I go there. 
You've got Stone Mountain Creek that runs around the east side of it and where it connects with Bullhead Creek. Bullhead Creek and Stone Mountain Creek are the two headwaters of the east prong of the Roaring River. Um, and then you've got Whittles Creek and Garden Creek are in the park. And then you've got Double Creek, Harris Creek, and Loveless that are right outside of the park. So uh, this is the area we're going to be, you know, we're going to be talking about tonight. There's 17 miles of trout stream in the park, of which we're going to be talking about roughly four miles of that with this watershed right here, or roughly 25% uh, of it. But before we do that, I'd like to, to talk with you about a little bit of trivia or history about, about the park. Um, in, it, I don't know how many of you know that there was a, 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 a cable car operation up on the parkway back in the 60s and 70s. Um, it, was, it was quite, a, quite, a, you know, quite an attention getter of everyone. And it was at mile, it was at mile post 234 is where the cable car ran. And I'm going to animate that for you to show you where it went. It went from Mahogany Rock to Devil's Garden um, was, was the length of it. And at that time, it, it, they claimed that it was the longest gondola span in the entire world. So it was, it was 3,784 feet long, almost eight tenths of a mile, a single span that, that ran cars back and forth. The dude's name was, was Worth Folger, kind of an entrepreneurial type guy, and he, he formed a land development company. And all in around Mahogany Rock here, there were about 250 home sites that he had, he had cut and divided up. And there were like nine occupied homes there in 1961. Um, and in 1968, Mahogany Rock Cableways own that whole area, the, the 200, 250 uh, acres along that area. Uh, he had a combination visitor's center, a gift shop, and a snack shop was built on Scott Ridge so that when the cable car left civilization over here and went to this area, that's the only place you could get food. Um, and so uh, it, was a, it was a going operation for a while. The attraction was not only the ride, which was pretty darn spectacular, but you could see Stone Mountain down the down the Bull Creek watershed. This is Stone Mountain on the top of the screen here. So you had a clear shot all the way down Bullhead Creek watershed to Stone to Stone Mountain State Park. So that was that was quite quite an attraction at the time. The problem is this, and here's the demise of the cable cable car business. Um, he couldn't put billboards up on the parkway because that was against the law. So he had a hard time, you know, attracting people to know exactly where he was. Um, seeing Stone Mountain from the cable car also required clear air. And of course, this area at, at, at the elevation of about 3,243 feet above sea level, there was a lot of fog in there. So a lot of people would get up there and they still couldn't see it. Another concern was that the wind on the span that long blew really hard and a lot of people would get, you know, get kind of spooked by it. Uh, but the biggest problem was the parking and the gawkers up and down the parkway that would pull off on the side of the parkway on, on all of the, 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 the viewpoints. And they were clogging the parkway up. And so it got to be very contentious between the parkway, between uh, the National Forest Service and and um, and Worth Folger, and he could see the writing on the wall. So what he did was contact the Nature Conservancy and negotiated with them to buy the 250 acres for $10 and other considerations. I don't know what those considerations was. Maybe it's free fishing license or something. But anyway, he sold the 250, 250 acres to the Conservancy, and they in turn turned around and, and, and sold it to the National Park Service who then um, handed it over to the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then Stone Mountain State Park moved their boundary up to where you had a, you went right from Blue Ridge Parkway into Stone Mountain State Park. So that's the, that's the story of Worth Folger's Mahogany Rock Cableways, Inc. I thought that was pretty cool. 
that at one point you could have been fishing down here in the headwaters and about 500 feet above you would have been a cable car going. That, 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 that seems amazing to me. Um, there's, there's really what the, the water, uh, where the water was flowing. This is, this is Buckhead, Bullhead Creek right here. Um, I'm gonna give you a better shot of that a bit, little bit later. Here's some quick images of the cable car. These are actually off the archives of the National Park Service. They were very kind to, to loan me. Um, and there's the fog. Uh, and that was, that's what really was the demise. Um, that's all that's left um, of the abutments and where they connected the cable cars. And um, you can still hike up there and see that. It's pretty, pretty neat. Um, the last thing, a little trivia that I'll, that I'll, I'll tell you uh, that some of you know, and this is, pro this is the most controversial thing about Bullhead Creek. There was a time when it was a pay to fish, it was privately owned. Um, it had a, a club that actually owned it at the time. Now, some people say it was a family, some say it was a club. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I think it was, was a club. And they had eight beats of what they would call a beat, a kind of a European style way of fishing for the public fishing is that they would, have, they would have a beat that would be anywhere from several hundred yards long to a half a mile to, in some cases, over a mile up here for number eight. Uh, if I remember correctly, the first time I fished it, you know, back in the 60s, um, beat one and two were before you got to Rich Mountain Creek, which is this one, and then uh, Rich Mountain Creek was number three, beat three, and then, and then four, five, and six, and seven were in this mid area here, and eight gave you access to, to, to the headwaters. So you would pay a daily fee. I think the first time I fished it, it was like 10 or 12 bucks. And uh, I fished section four above Rich Mountain Creek and, and caught some really nice fish. Um, I, I understand that the club that sold this to Stone Mountain State Park is now the club that's on Wilson Creek down in Edgemont and Mortimer. I don't know that for a fact, but that's, that's what I've heard some people say. So when they decided to sell the property to Stone Mountain State Park, the deal was that the state would continue feeding the fish. Um, and, and they did. Um, up into the 80s, I know, they were feeding them about three times a week during the summer. And during the winter, they'd feed them about twice a week. But at some point, um, who knows why, they stopped feeding them um, and the trout disappeared. Now, the controversy is, did they disappear because they were poached out of there? Did they disappear because they were so big that they ate themselves out of a habitat and a lot of them just died? Um, there were a lot of floods during that time that would have flushed a lot of these fish out. You know, who knows? A lot of these fish could have died of old age in a natural habitat like that. So um, there's a lot of controversy and old stories about, you know, how it got to the way it is now. But uh, the locals now complain that, you know, it's just not what it used to be. It just doesn't fish like it used to be. Well, no kidding. No, they're not feeding the fish. So um, but there's still fish in there. So it's just now a wild trout stream. They're, they don't charge to fish. I verified this, uh, confirmed this uh, last week, in fact. Um, so they continued to charge, as far as my understanding, up until about uh, two, uh, 2015, 2015. Um, nearly all of the beats are, are uh, the signs. Here's one, uh, beat eight, and you can see that it's just about gone itself. Um, I consider beat five, six, and seven to be the best fishing. Um, that middle area right there above Rich Mountain is relatively flat through there, and you get a you get uh, it's easy, pretty pretty darn easy fishing through there. You get above here, and you get into some uh, gradients in excess of 15 and 18 percent. Um, so this lower area that I'm going to show you in a minute is very very um, civilized down here. So. Uh, at one time, it was pay for fishing. It's not anymore. And um, I'm glad. I'm glad because I like chasing wild fish. But there's still some nice fish in there. Um, let's, let's look at Bullhead Creek 
as an overview. And then we're going to get into the sections of it. And I'm going to give you some idea of kind of, you know, what it looks like, what fish, what, what you're going to catch and things like that. Uh, Bullhead, as I mentioned before, is a 4,100 acre watershed. And it's named after one of the mountain ridges uh, above it, I'll point out to you, that's on the north side of the parkway. In my opinion, there's only two fishable tributaries to this stream, although there's a couple of, there's a couple of, of, of watersheds that, that stay dry most of the time, but there's no really flowing water coming out of it big enough to maintain a fishery. Uh, there's no large falls on this stream. There are some falls, but they're not really big falls. Uh, the main flow is pretty easy to fish, especially the middle section. So I, I rank it, the way I rank it in the book, this is actually clipped out of the book for each of the watersheds. I gave it a four out of a five uh, because number one, there's a lot of good outback fishing. There's big, there's some open stream fishing if you like that. And there's some blue liners if you like that. And there's brook brown and rainbow trout in there. Um, um, I highlighted the gradient here at 8.9. Uh, so it, it, you know, it over a 3.9 mile um, run, it loses about 1,800 feet. Uh, so you've got a roughly a 9% gradient there, which is a moderate, it's not too bad. Most anyone can, can, can fish that type of gradient. You get above about 12 or 15, it starts getting kind of steep. Um, so that's a little bit... Um, the way I describe each of the watersheds at the beginning of each chapter for each. Um, now, here's, here's kind of a, a look of the way it flows down the valley. It comes off, the, off of, off of the, the Blue Ridge Parkway uh, between where the cable car was. It runs all the way down the 3.9 miles down to Stone Mountain Creek. And they, they then, the confluence of those forms the the east fork of the, the east prong of the roaring river uh, and it goes follows the road all the way down um, the tributaries uh, are feeders you have horse cove creek is the first one it also comes off the parkway actually sources further beyond the parkway than bullhead does and it's definitely a blue line stream um, this area in in here um, if I can, if I can find my cursor, um, I was, this area looks as though it would, it would, it would form and drain water. And it certainly does drain water, but it, it is not a flowable creek that, in my opinion, supports trout. Uh, that's not true about Rich Mountain Creek, which runs for two miles all the way up into farmland off the map over here. And uh, that's another blue liner. Uh, there's some tight areas on that, but there are some areas that it opens up to. So that's the general schematic of, of Bullhead Creek. Now what I'm gonna do is drill down into this area right here, and we're gonna start and kind of walk our way up through here. At, at, at the mouth of Bullhead Creek, um, which, is, which is here on Stone Mountain Creek, it is, it is roughly half a mile, technically 0.4 miles, up to Rich Mountain Creek. Um, and, and I consider that the lower section because I, I, I include Rich Mountain Creek uh, along with this four mile, 0.4 miles coming up from Stone Mountain um, as, as the lower section. Uh, this is me standing down next to the, the east, east Prong, um, which by the time both of those creeks come together, they form a pretty nice looking little, little mountain stream there, although it's in a park and um, have, will have a lot of rock hoppers and, and bait fishermen. This is actually the delayed harvest section right here of, of uh, the East Prong. This, this is Stone, th this is Bullhead Creek. This is Stone Mountain Creek coming in from um, uh, Creek Wright. And they form together, and that's what forms the east, the east prong of the Roaring River that continues on down and gets pretty big. So as you as you go under this bridge and start moving upstream, this is a little brown trout. In a, there, there are several pools in that 0.4 miles that um, that that still have some really nice fish in there. And this is probably about the biggest fish I've caught on bullhead. 
Uh, this this stream, as I understand, this this pool that you're looking at is one of the pools that the Park Service and the original owners of the of the creek would store their fish in, um, or keep fish, and then they would net them and take them up into the areas and turn them loose when they were stocking. Uh, this is further upstream, a really nice dark pool. You can see the the laurel and rhododendron are starting to close in on that. Uh, there's a nice little little rainbow, the interesting thing, uh, you know, it looks like he's looking at that flyer right there, but um, there's just loads of little rainbows in there. You don't see a lot of this. Uh, there's only a few of these, uh, and most of them are in that lower section where it'll open up and and where you can, where you can, you know, really get after it where you're fishing. But all of these little pools that you're looking at, like this one, um, especially with, with a drop pool, there's, there, you, you hang back over here and roll over into this area. Um, th these fish just hang out in here and uh, they're looking for something to eat. Now, up at 0.4 miles is where Rich Mountain Creek comes in. Now, it's the first tributary or the lower tributary of Bullhead Creek. I rank it a, I rank it a three uh, just because it's, it's hard fishing. I mean, you're bushwhacking through most of it. Uh, when, when you get up there, it opens up into some areas that 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 you can get into. But it's really um, between two really steep peaks, um, in, which gives you a moderate, uh, about a 10.5 um, average gradient, and that's starting to get up there. It's dropping a it's dropping a thousand feet, 1,100 feet over two miles. So that's about 550 feet per mile, and that 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 can start that can start getting you winded um, if you fish fast like I do. The only thing I've ever caught in Rich Mountain Creek are bows and rainbows. I think if I went further up, I've only fished about probably three quarters of a mile to a mile up it, only half of its run, and I've I've only caught bows and and uh, browns in there, uh, but. This is um, past the confluence, past its mouth, about a hundred yards, and this is this is what it it looks like. Um, nice little brown trout uh, that are in there. Uh, this one is this this would this is a big fish for that for that creek. Uh, as you get a little further up, you get into this. You get into the laurel and rhododendron and dead falls coming up coming across. Of course, that's that's a good thing because that forms a lot of habitat for the fish. And there's always some rainbows and browns hanging around in those areas, but you'll get another 10 yards beyond this on Rich Mountain and it'll open up and you'll have 50 or 75 yards of open fishing. Um, so it's, it's, a good, it's a good little stream. And if you like blue line streams, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a nice little stream. Uh, trails are a problem along that stream. You, you, a lot of bushwhacking and the old trail that was used during the beet fishing times uh, has grown over a lot. And uh, so you have to do a lot of your own bushwhacking. Now, let's talk about the midsection. This midsection is 2.1 miles and it runs from Rich Mountain Creek up to Horse Cove Creek. So this is the longest section. And, and in my opinion, it's the best fishing section in the, in the, on the whole watershed is from is from this area down here um, at at the bottom uh, up to about right here, uh, which would have which would have been sections four, five, and six probably uh, in the beat section uh, or the beat fishing uh, model that was being used before. Um, the, you, you see a lot of this, the trail crisscrosses. It's a, it's a rugged trail. Uh, it crisscrosses the stream numerous times. And in some cases would get above the trail, um, you, know, you know, maybe 10 or 15 yards. And so you'll be looking down. The good, the good part of that is that you, you can see the fish. In fact, there, there is a trout right there, a pretty darn good sized trout is the reason I stopped. And when I saw him, I took this image. But that fish right there is probably probably 12 or 13 inches long at least. I don't I don't know what he was because I didn't I didn't catch him. But anyway, um, you get a lot of scenes like that. Pretty little brown trout. I mean, um, uh, Bullhead has just got some really pretty fish in there. Um, 
I hear a lot of people that, you know, in the blogs talk about, you know, they go to bullhead and they just don't catch anything. And I don't, I just don't understand that because I catch fish, you know, every time I have fished bullhead and over the last um, 35 to 40 years, I fished this stream probably 10 times. Um, this is another tight run. The only reason I took this picture was because of the sun uh, silhouetting me against the creek down on the bottom. And it kind of spooked me for a minute because I was walking along and I looked over there and something was walking <laughs> down there next to me. And then I realized it was it was me. Um, this is just me. You see a lot of this stack from from the flash flooding um, that has taken place down through the years that 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 have stack all the rocks up in an eddy area. Um, oh, wrong way. Um, this is a this is in that that mid area that I tell you I like to really fish um, in that six and seven five six and seven area. It'll open up like this. Um, it'd be totally void of 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 um, rhododendron and laurel and just other types of deciduous plant life that's not as quite as hard to fish around. Uh, but that's uh, those, this is good fishing up through this area right here. A lot of roll casting, another little brown, uh, like those red spots on him. Um, this was a winter shot um, that was shot uh, probably 10 years ago or 12 years ago in October and all the leaves were off the trees. It's quite beautiful up there during that time because you can see a lot of the ridges around you. Uh, but you can see that this, this is rare. You get in this open area in that midsection and it opens up for you and gives you an opportunity to really get after the fish. And, um, and, and, and there's quite a few of them in there. Um, this is a, a, a brook trout, uh, obviously, that 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 I caught and it's it's the biggest brook trout I caught. This is about a 12 inch brook trout, which for a stream like this, uh, and this was in the this was toward the upper part of that midsection where the water's getting kind of small. Um, it was it was a big fish for up in that area. Um, it, back in that lower section that I was showing you earlier, some of the delayed I'm convinced some of the delayed harvest fish come up that stream and you'll catch some larger than normal fish in there also. Uh, you can catch some 14 inch fish in there that come up from the delayed harvest, but pretty little brook trout. Um, this is just a picture that I took because I just, I was amazed by uh, this, this tree and how it had twisted uh, down through the years uh, with the ice and everything uh, and wind especially. And um, that's how trees, get strong, um, they, they twist and it forms a tensile strength that keeps them from breaking um, according to the foresters. Um, okay, let's talk for a minute about the, the upper section which includes Horse Cove Creek which goes off to the right there uh, up past the parkway and then uh, Bullhead which continues on up to just before you get to the parkway and, and between uh, the, 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 the tram rides that you used to be able to take. Um, this at first, let's look at Horse Cove because that's, that's, we're not going to come back down to that. But it's, this is a, a scene on Horse Cove where the creek is coming down through uh, the rocks. And literally, in many cases, it'll just disappear and go down into the cracks and crevices and then pop back out, you know, five or 10 yards later. Um, this is. <laughs> Um, I guess, you know, you could say I have no shame. I'll catch any size of fish that I can. This is a, you know, like a three inch brook trout up there. But the interesting thing is look, look at the size of that, of that ant that I'm in, in the girdle on this ant. This is a huge, this is like a, like a 12 or 14 ant. And I don't know any way this fish could have gotten that ant in its mouth, but they, these fish are so hungry and so aggressive that I just find them to go after just about anything you put in the water if you, if you put it to them right, and it looks anything halfway resembling what they normally eat, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna go after it. Uh, this is a little further up, a little, little, um, little spill release right there. There's a nice pool above that, um, and. Um, this is about as far as I went on that two mile, with that mile, little over a mile run. I, this was about three quarters of a mile up. Um, 
Now back to Bullhead, and just, just this is above the confluence of of Horse Cove and Bullhead. This is what it starts looking like. It starts taking on a lot of gradient, which I like because although you have to do some some climbing, it means a lot of drop pools, and which are my favorite fishing um, type of water or fishing the drop pools, and so um, this is a little brook trout. This is about a um, probably about a six inch brook trout. And the interesting thing about the reason I put this, this image in there, look at the teeth on this brook trout. I just don't remember catching brook trout anywhere else that had teeth like this fish has. I mean, this sucker could bite you if you put your hand in his mouth, but it's just a beautiful, just a beautiful fish for a little stream like that. Um, a little further up, you get into some open areas like this. This is a really large pool at the bottom of the of, of the screen here. And then you've got this, this, this run coming out of it. And then another nice pool here. And it, it's really just a stair step cascade. In some cases a go on for, you know, a hundred yards like that. And just offers a lot of fishing opportunity. Uh, there's another little, little brook trout. Again, look at the size of that fly. Uh, it's a huge fly for a really small fish. This is um, a drop pool that's one of my favorites. Um, I, I, you can stand right here in the falls coming out and, and, and lay your bugs over and nobody sees you. And uh, I've caught as many as three fish out of this, this pool before they quit, quit biting. Well, folks, that's, that's uh, Bullhead Creek and its tributaries.